Hey guys, one of the broad differences between thermal devices and analog night vision devices is that thermal devices tend to be built for very specific tasks. A basic and fairly affordable PVS-14 night vision monocular can be used to spot targets at night, move both on foot or in a vehicle, as well as engage targets with your rival using both active and passive aiming methods. That's just not the case with thermal devices. If you have a thermal monocular, you will be able to move reasonably well, at least on foot. You can't drive a vehicle wearing a thermal monocular because they can't see through glass. A thermal monocular can be used for handheld spotting or static observation, but you cannot use it to engage targets because it can't see through the glass of your optic for passive aiming, and it cannot pick up your IR laser for active aiming. If you only want a thermal device for static observation or sweeping an area for potential targets, then there are monoculars that have higher zoom and would be better suited for exclusively observation. But those can't be helmet mounted. You can't just walk around with one of those on your face. If you want to use thermal to engage targets, you have options such as a thermal weapon sight or a clip-on thermal imager for a rifle scope. Most thermal weapon sights are not nearly as effective as traditional optics, magnified or otherwise for use during the day, but they can be extremely effective at night. But again, you're not going to walk around with your eyeball glued to the back of a 4X thermal scope on your rifle. Having the ability to attach a thermal clip-on to your rifle's day scope does allow you to retain your ability to shoot during the daytime. However, the thermal clip-ons intended to go in front of a rifle scope do not typically have any other use. The eyepieces just aren't really suited to being held up to your eye. At least a thermal weapon sight can be used standalone in a hurry, since you are meant to look directly into them with your unaided eyeball. If you want to add the high contrast detection capabilities of thermal imagers to your existing night vision, you can get a clip-on thermal imager that goes onto a night vision monocular or set of binoculars. There are also some fusion devices that have that already built into a night vision monocular, such as one available from AGM. Basically, what I'm trying to get at is that there is no universal thermal. There is no single thermal device that you can just buy and cover all your bases at once. So if you're really invested in thermal, you probably will end up owning more than one thermal device at some point. We can talk about what thermals it makes sense to buy when and why later on in the video or some other time, but today we're going to be talking about the AGM Stinger 640. This is a multi-purpose thermal device. It's still not a universal device that will fulfill all of your thermal requirements in a single unit, but it does fill multiple roles. The AGM Stinger 640 is chiefly a wearable monocular. It's intended to be helmet mounted and used for navigation and detection. However, you can also use it as both a thermal clip-on as well as a standalone thermal weapon sight. Obviously, this isn't going to be equally suited to all of those tasks because the attributes that make it good as a wearable monocular are not the same things you look for in a thermal weapon sight. The Stinger 640 is not magnified. If you're looking for a thermal weapon sight or a handheld monocular for observation and detection purposes, you're probably going to want more magnification because it greatly increases the range at which you can detect and identify a target. Reference the video I already made talking about the basics of thermal devices for more. If you watched that video, you remember that almost all thermal devices will try to put the resolution of the device somewhere in the name of the device just so you know what you're getting. So the Stinger 640 has a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels. There's also a lower resolution version of this, which is probably the one you should get, but we'll talk about that later on. When it comes to thermal devices, higher resolution almost always leads to increased detection and identification range. And that is the case with the Stinger 640 compared to lower resolution unmagnified thermals, but that still doesn't mean this thing is well suited for long range detection. This thing is predominantly meant to be worn on a helmet. It is very small, very lightweight, and it includes a dovetail helmet mount in the box. But it also includes a Picatinny rail mount, so you can mount this thing in front of a day optic, or you can just mount it on a gun right back by your eyeball and use it as a thermal weapon sight. If you're using the Stinger 640 as a thermal weapon sight, you can turn on a crosshair, which you can then zero to match your rifle. It's a little bit unintuitive, as is the case with most thermals, but you can figure it out. If you're using it as a clip-on, you can go into the menu and enable a clip-on mode, which optimizes the screen to be a little bit more useful when used as a clip-on, and also allows you to shift the image around to mitigate the effect of zero shift. The very early versions of the Stinger did not have the clip-on mode enabled. You could still use them as a clip-on, but you would get a very large zero shift. I tested that version a little bit and the zero shift was substantial, but at least it was pretty repeatable. So in theory, you could just remember what your shift was and dial it in when you stick the scope on. Yeah, so nice. That is pretty high, isn't it? 
Yep, high half a target. So if I hold, I hold like probably about six inches low basically on the stem of the stand. That was a hit, upper right edge. Same spot, stacked it. Right edge. So yeah, there's definitely, there's at least a vertical shift, maybe even a little bit of a horizontal shift. So either maybe you uh, memorize it and account for it, or you just put it on re-zero, call it a day. And those were all dead center hits. Since the release of the Stinger, AGM has updated the firmware to include a clip-on mode, which shrinks the screen down a little bit and then allows you to shift it in the image of the eyepiece, which allows you to compensate for the zero shift. Again, it's a little finicky to set up, but that's kind of the name of the game when it comes to thermal devices. There's a good possibility that if you go out right now and buy a Stinger from a third-party retailer, you're going to get one of the pre-firmware updated versions and you will have to send it back to AGM to get updated. Unlike a lot of their other models, the firmware is apparently not something you can easily do on your home PC. As a thermal weapon sight, the Stinger works reasonably well at close range, but it's not very fast. Thermal reflexes are something that has been tried before. For example, SIG used to make a series of low magnification thermals called the Echo series. I don't think they do anymore because it's just not the greatest idea. The Stinger is a little better suited for use as a thermal clip-on. I don't think I want to dedicate a rifle to an exclusive thermal optic for just so many reasons, but being able to add thermal capability to an existing rifle is pretty neat. Resolution is pretty important when it comes to thermal clip-ons because you're essentially zooming in on the back of a screen and the more pixels are on the screen, the easier it will be to see. However, since those pixels on the screen can only display image they get from the sensor, a higher resolution sensor is pretty important. I think almost all thermal devices have a very similar resolution of the screen. It's probably 1024 by 768, which is as much or more than the resolution of almost any thermal sensor anybody you've ever met could afford. The more resolution you have to work with, the farther you can zoom in on the screen before you go past the point of diminishing returns and actually start to regress in image quality. I think the Stinger 640 works pretty well from the 1 to 6 range, like on an LPVO, or it actually works pretty well in front of a low magnification prism optic, and you can also use it on a higher magnification scope as long as you dial the zoom back to a more moderate level. Even more expensive, higher resolution thermal devices are not quite the cheat code you may have been led to believe by years of G1 footage. All of that stuff was with massive cooled thermal units mounted to helicopters and tanks. That's the reason why it looks so awesome and can detect people from such a long way away. Portable, handheld, individual thermal devices are not quite so magical. If you're in an environment where everything is the same temperature, then any potential target is going to stand out like a sore thumb. But if you're in an environment with a lot of mixed temperatures, for example, a treed environment that has patches of dirt, grass, rocks, stumps, etc., it's going to be quite the overload of information. So the Stinger does an okay job as a clip-on, and in a pinch you could use it as a standalone sight. But what it's obviously intended for is use as a wearable thermal monocular. As a thermal monocular, I compared the Stinger 640 side-by-side -side with the FLIR Breach, which made for a pretty interesting comparison. The FLIR Breach is getting very long in the tooth. They still sell it, but it really hasn't changed in a pretty long time, so it's a very low-resolution device. The FLIR Breach may in fact be a higher quality device with a technically higher quality sensor, but that resolution makes a huge difference. The Stinger 640 has a much higher resolution and that does make it a lot easier to detect and identify things when using this thing as a wearable monocular. The Stinger also has a focusing lens assembly, kind of like a PVS-14, which you can use to further sharpen or refine the image, whereas the FLIR Breach doesn't have a focus. It's just fixed at some distance. I don't know what that distance is. Both devices have several color palettes to choose from. They're very different, but I don't find any of the color palette options on any thermal devices that I've tried to be that much better than just the classic black hot and white hot modes. Your mileage may vary, but I feel like a lot of the other color palettes give you weird levels of information that you don't really need, and it just does more to distract you than anything else. 
One thing that does set the FLIR Breach apart from the Stinger is that it feels like a much more mature product, like they spent a lot of time really thinking about what should and shouldn't go into making a wearable thermal monocular. Like I said, the FLIR Breach doesn't have the ability to focus the image, but that actually seems totally acceptable for a wearable monocular, particularly a low resolution one. You're not really looking to identify the contours of a specific human being's face, you're just trying to use it to get a sense of where potential targets might be. The Breach also has some other features, really just refinements in the menu and the fact that if you flip it upside down, the menus automatically flip based on a motion sensor rather than having to go into the settings and change the orientation of the menu, stuff like that. The FLIR Breach also has the ability to record to onboard storage, whereas the Stinger does not have the ability to record. It's actually one of the few AGM thermal devices that doesn't record on its own. I guess the first question is, which would I prefer as a wearable monocular, the FLIR Breach or the AGM Stinger? The first part of my answer is that I'd probably go with the FLIR Breach, but the second part of my answer will make the first part sort of moot. You'll see why. If we're just talking about a wearable thermal device, then the best configuration seems to be what you see here, a thermal mounted on your off eye that you can use to sweep for targets. If you actually need to engage, then you're going to have to raise up your rifle and either use some other type of optic on that rifle or switch to white light and go from there. Aha, you say, what about bridged thermal? Well, I don't think that's a real thing. I set up the FLIR breach and a PVS-14 in a panel bridge and I tried to get the images to collimate and I handed it off to other people who tried to get the images to collimate and it just wasn't fucking happening. One of the two images is going to be enough clearer that your brain just discards the other one and all you get is the image from one of those devices, be it the thermal or the night vision monocular. The FLIR breach gives you the ability to shift the image around inside the display screen, which in theory allows you to collimate it with a night vision device on your other eye, but in practice there's just no way because the images are too dissimilar. You might not think that the LCD screen in the back of a thermal and the phosphor screen in the back of a PVS-14 are all that different in theory, but in practice, yeah, seems to be the case. Here's a fun trick you can try when you're in bed tonight. Hold your phone up to your face really close, and you'll probably notice that it's a lot easier just to let your eyes remain at a relaxed position looking forward and only look at the screen with one eye rather than to cross your eyes and try to look at the screen with both eyes. Basically, one of your eyeballs is going to see the screen and the other one is going to just give up because it's not getting too much useful information. That's what bridged thermal is like. Your mileage may vary. I've seen some people who swear to God they can do bridged thermal, but I've also seen some people who swear to God the MRO doesn't have a parallax problem or who swear to God that they've never accidentally ND'd their fucking white light clicky cap. Those people are liars and it's not our job to listen to them. Alright, let's try to wrap this up in a reasonable time frame for once. Is the AGM Stinger 640 a good wearable thermal monocular? Yeah, but judged strictly as a wearable monocular, I don't think the higher resolution is worth the extra cost. A helmet-worn monocular is best used to scan for potential targets, and once you see a heat signature, you act accordingly. To engage the target, you're still going to need to use white light or another type of night optic. The fidelity of the thermal device isn't as critical, because its job is just to tell you if there's something there that bears further investigation. However, if you intend to use the Stinger for its capabilities as a thermal clip-on, then you had better spring for the 640 model, not the 384. Resolution is a huge limiting factor for clip-ons. Ultimately, I'm not a big fan of helmet-mounted thermals. I still think analog night vision is much more useful and cost-effective for moving and shooting, so if you really want to add the high contrast detection capability of thermal to your helmet, you're better off getting a clip-on thermal imager that goes with an analog night vision device. What makes the Stinger worth considering is that it handles three very different jobs, all of them reasonably well. You can get a lot of use out of one while you figure out what other thermal devices you'll end up wanting to supplement it with. But if for some reason you just really want a thermal monocular with no other tricks up its sleeve, I'd probably recommend the FLIR Breach. It's a bit cheaper than either model of the Stinger, and the ease of use and simplicity of the Breach is better suited for helmet-worn use. It seems like a more mature and more purpose-built product. I'm still not a fan of the concept, though. Thank you guys for watching. If you'd like to support this channel, you can subscribe, and you can click the link in the video description to support me on Subscribestar. You'll get access to early videos, bonus videos, archived live shows, and also the secret Discord cat channel. See you guys next time.